All right, you guys, so today's video is going to be about an article I found on Kotaku of all websites. I know the TMZ of video game gaming news. So this one I thought was pretty cool, and that is hardware that was way ahead of its time. And while I was looking through these article, this article and this slideshow, I noticed that there was like one company that was on it quite a bit, and it's a company I love. So anyways, you guys, let's get into it. But before we get into it, don't forget, mash that like button. Subscribe, because every little bit helps. We're looking to get to 6,000 subscribers. You know, I'm hoping by the end of the year, which would be pretty dope. We got about a month left. Anyways, let's get into it. Let's talk about it. The very first one is going to be a wireless Atari 2600 controller. Truth be told, I had no idea that this even existed. Um, today, every, uh, every console comes with a wireless gaming pad. I don't like how they said gaming pad. It's a controller, damn it. But that wasn't always the case. It's true because I remember being young and sitting like three to five feet from my goddamn original Nintendo. Um, uh, the good old NES had several uh, from third parties, but credit for the very first one. Uh, example goes to Atari back in 1983. If you look at this, this is a big old box with the wireless controllers. It's definitely interesting, and I had no idea Atari even offered these things. It's pretty dope. Moving on to the next one. Built Sega Dreamcast, and it's built-in modem. Um, dude, I ain't gonna lie. I remember seeing the Sega Dreamcast for the first time. I think it was 1999. Yeah. So in 2003, online features and video games are nearly as common as glitches. Exactly. Um, the short-lived but beloved 1998 Dreamcast for helping popularize the idea of shipping consoles with built-in network connections. Let me tell you. I remember... I can't remember which 360 it was, but one of my first 360s I bought a wireless adapter for, and it was like $100 just for this wireless adapter, but let me tell you, I needed it. Sega of America insisted on getting a 56K modem in in the box at the Dreamcast $199 price point, marking, uh, marking the beginning of a new era for consoles online play for everyone. Um, like I said, this was just interesting because like, I remember there's this game on here. It's called Seaman. And S-E-A-M-A-N. And the voice of Leonard Nimoy is it. And it's a fish with a human face. It is what I like to call Nightmare Fuel. But my brother loved that game. And I remember watching him play it. Um, on top of that, I loved the Sonic games for the Sega Dreamcast. The Dreamcast was way ahead of its time. But I... I understand why Sega got out of the game there. Let's go to the next one. The Virtual Boy. Go away, MetaQuest. So the Virtual Boy, it was interesting. Because I never owned a Virtual Boy. My best friend did. So I've played with the Virtual Boy a little bit. Not too much. But I will admit, it's very disorienting. And on top of that, like everything in the headset. Because like you put it on... And you have it sitting, obviously, as you could tell, like these, you have it sitting on like a table. Everything is in red. And it gets very, disorient very disorienting. And on top of that, it'll give you a headache. Obviously, this is way ahead of its time because if you scroll up here, we now have the MetaQuest 3. So, like, past and then present up here. That's pretty cool that ads actually popped up right there. Moving on to the next slide. Um, Microvision paves the way for modern ha handheld gaming. So I've never heard of Microvision. So let's scroll down here. In 1979, Milton Bradley Microvision wasn't the first playable device that played games, but it was the first one to use changeable cartridges. Okay, so what makes this one different is you can swap cartridges. It's like the Game Boy before the Game Boy was cool. Um, Nintendo would later implement in the 1989 Game Boy. Okay, I, I, I kind of jumped ahead. While the system was a mild success, even getting its own Star Trek game, bro, <laughs> it wasn't a great product overall and suffered from numerous issues. But hey, it did make a cameo appearance in Friday the 13th Part 2. So that's neat, I guess. Huh. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Next one. <sighs> I actually have one of these still. It's actually behind the green screen on the shelf behind me. It's Game Boy Camera. 
So I remember when I bought this, it was like, it takes the most god awful grainy pictures ever. On top of that, I remember the printer that came with it. You would take the coolest pictures you thought were the coolest pictures when I was like six, seven, eight years old, and then like print them on this printer. And bro, it came out. It was bad. Um, let's see the high. The images weren't high resolution. Only one twenty eight by one twenty eight, and in four shades of monochrome. Four shades of monochrome. But the nineteen ninety eight camera accessory was likely the first time a lot of kids were able to uh, take their own digital camera, which 100% was true. I remember, I think, it was probably, two, yeah, I was probably like eight or nine when, when I uh, got my hands on one for the first time, checked it out, and it was it was game-changing. Let's go to the next slide. Sega Activator, a.k.a. the Retro Connect. So this is interesting. Look, you got, like, this square that you jump around in. I have no idea. Um... It was an odd duck for sure, but it was a first full body motion controller predicated, uh, predating the Xbox 360 Connect motion control add on by over a decade. Jesus Christ! Designed by Sega and Interactive Lights, uh, 1993 Activator was an octagon shaped ring you placed on the floor and plugged into your Sega Genesis. You could then, in theory, kick and punch in a game. That's pretty cool. I did not know that existed. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Sega, by the way. I love Sega. Next one. Okay. So the Super Game Boy. The Super Game Boy was so amazing. And I think it kind of came out at the perfect time. Um, because I want to say it came out roughly the same time as the Pokemon games. And that's the only reason why we ended up getting one was um, for the Pokemon games. Like we went, we would go to like um, yard sales and stuff like that, pick up old Sega, I mean Super Nintendos, and we would come across Super Game Boys and stuff like that. And we picked it up actually just to play. I wanted to play my Pokemon right on the TV, and it's definitely, definitely so worth it. It was just so much easier than the. Um, GameCube ver version where it, like it slid into the bottom of the GameCube and you had to put the disc in and uh, Let me tell you the super super Game Boy was definitely worth it World's first holographic video game Vigimo game. Okay, so I kind of remember this because um, They used to show like TV shows and stuff on Nickelodeon and it, it just makes me think of that um, Time Travelers is a Sega arcade game from 1990 run that runs off a laser disc if you guys didn't know, Laserdisc actually predates DVDs, and they were like big old DVDs, and plays a lot like Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair is a lot of fun, by the way, which makes sense. A Time Traveler was designed by Dragon's Lair creator Rick Dyer. Okay. When it was released, Sega described the game as the world's first holographic video game. Technically, this arcade game from Sega isn't using real holograms, but the effect is still pretty dang cool and feels futuristic even in 2023. Like Dragon's Lair, it's not great to actually play, but if you've ever seen one in person, it's worth marveling over a bit. I'll have to see if I can't find one of these, because it kind of kind of piques my interest here, especially if it's done by the guy who does uh, Dragon's Lair. Okay, so this one was actually pretty cool. This is one I kind of want to talk about, because I, I kind of went through the slides a little bit, and that's Sega Channel. So Sega Channel is actually the very first... Um, like, I guess, download, like, kind of like an Xbox Marketplace, PlayStation Store, all that stuff, where you could go download games and play them, and it came out in 1994, and they discontinued it in 1998. Like, and on top of that, I think the part that really blows my mind, that right here, it says, only taking a few minutes to download a full game. Bro, this is before, like, now granted, I mean, Sega games aren't really that big. You're talking megabytes versus gigabytes, but it's still ridiculous to think that in 1994, you were able to download Sega games and play them, like, on your TV. It's insane. All right, so the PC, the PC Engine played games off of CDs in 1988, um, this is a Turbo Graphics. Turbo Graphics is like a ridiculous, ridiculous like powerhouse of a console back in the day, um, and you were able to play CDs off of it in 1998. That's pretty dope. Well, I talk about it much? No, 
next one. And that is the end of it. But uh, like I said, it was just interesting to see some of these, uh, <laughs> some of these way before their time things that I remember as a kid actually playing with and actually going to the store and buying and it makes me feel old and it just it was just like a walk down memory lane especially seeing a dreamcast uh game boy you know camera the super game boy for your super nintendo like oh it's so dope anyways you guys hopefully you guys have a wonderful wonderful day a wonderful weekend and i'll catch you later bye